All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our session. And so I am here, and it's my great pleasure to be able to um, introduce Dr. Michael Cosimini. He is uh, a colleague of mine, and um, I will get him to kick us off. And he's also super nerdy about serious games and gamification and such. So game-based learning is Michael's thing, and I will have him go ahead and take the stage. Thank you, Teresa. Thanks for that very um, accurate introduction. Welcome everybody who's joining us. Um, I really appreciate you taking this time in your in your afternoon or evening or even some of the other time zones. Um, I saw it jump up in that chat. I know we're doing this around dinner time for some of you. So if you want to be cooking your dinner or doing other things while you're on the video, there is no judgment about any of that. Um, so just, you know, be how you are and you're very welcome here. We are going to be doing some interactive stuff a little bit later. So we'll be breaking up into small groups. So keep an eye out for those opportunities to join those groups. Because a lot of the we're going to talk about games and in particular serious games today, um, there's a lot of people on our panel here who have designed their own serious games who have COI that I'm just going to show you here briefly. Um, and we're going to touch base on some of these games um, through the through the course of the afternoon or evening here. Um, and then we are going to jump in with Eric here um, and we're going to start talking a little bit about games, gamification and serious games and uh, why these are valuable to us as educators. Excellent. Thanks so much, Michael. I really appreciate it. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're all familiar with the old adage of how people uh, were taught um, from the time that we started medical education and, and revamped it at the turn of the century. Um, the idea that you could basically just pour knowledge into people and they would walk out knowing what they know. And I think we know now that that's really not true. And there's a lot of cognitive science behind it. And we're going to talk about how games leverage that cognitive science of how people actually learn and more problem solving that we're going to talk about in a second. And so we know now passive learning people pass out. Um, so there's a reason why it's called passive. Um, and so we're really trying to recreate how medical education's experience and health professions education across the spectrum, doing a lot more problem-based learning, a lot more active learning. And I think we all know that really it's not any more putting knowledge into your, your students, it's more giving them the knowledge to be able to solve complex problems. And our problems are only getting harder. And so we really need to teach them a lot of those complex skills. And games are not, uh, not, are not uh, they, they date back very, very far back. So this is 3700 BC. This is in Egypt. This is a game called Senate. Um, so games have existed for as long as, as human existence has existed. And a lot of people now, when they think about games, they think about Pac-Man, they think about Super Mario Brothers. We're not necessarily going to be talking about those, but we're going to talk about some of the elements and fundamentals of those, of those games. And so the big thing that I always get asked about when, you know, people are talking to me about games, they're like, oh, games are just for kids. Well, we know that that's not true. In fact, 2.6 billion people across the world play video games. It's a third of the world's population. And that includes any types of games, not just video games. This includes mobile games. And we often get people who say, oh, I don't play games. It's like, have you ever played Candy Crush? Have you ever played Angry Birds? Have you ever played Sudoku? Have you ever played chess? All of these are games. So you, by definition, play games. A lot of people say it's for young people. In fact, the average average game player is actually 35 years old. And so these statistics are a little bit older, but you know, even during the pandemic, we saw a massive influx of people into the game space. And this actually even went to older individuals who are now stuck at home with some free time playing a lot more games. The games industry as a whole is estimated to be about $257 billion as of 2025. This is a massive business. This is not just a fly-by-night Pac-Man and Mario Brothers. And really what we're here for is the idea that games can actually impart real life skills. And there's a lot of different life skills that can come from games and we're using them in a bunch of different industries. And we'll talk about that in a second. So th there's a lot of different types of skills that can be taught with games. And we're looking at psychomotor, mechanical, technical, strategic leadership. Think about all the games that you played. Think about how much leadership skills people get by playing massive online games. Think about empathy when you're playing narrative-based games. Um, you know, when, when uh, Legend of Zelda, when Link died, you actually like got a little hurt um, because Link had died. And so there's empathy that actually gets imparted. Communication, all these different skills actually come part and parcel within games. And often they're deliberately designed to have you foster these skills. 
And there's lots of higher order thinking skills that we're really trying to drive for in medical education, health professions education that are being demonstrated. Think about people who are creating mods for Minecraft. They're creating their own modifications of certain games. They're actually using their knowledge to create games. A colleague of mine actually utilized Minecraft to try and teach bio biopetrochemical processing at UT Dallas. He actually recreated all the processes that go into mining and um, purifying petrochemicals so that his students could figure out how to actually create a world in which they can create their own products with those, and they actually integrate it within the curriculum. So there's no, there's no doubt that we have evidence that skills from games and people who play games are actually better at doing very heavy hand-eye coordination skills within the operating room, whether it be robotic surgery or laparoscopic surgery, which is where most of the research has been done. And now we even have games that are actually utilizing the instruments that we use within the operating room. So this is from Grendel Games. This is actually a laparoscopic game. And we'll talk a lot about how the goals of the game and how they can be tangential to the actually skills that are being developed and why that's so important when in game development. So games is not a new area of interest. You can see here, this is just TED Talks on how games are being applied, both within the therapeutic space as well as the education space across multiple industries. And the nice thing about medicine, or the nice thing about games is, and why we're excited about it is there's very strong ties between emotions and memory. And games live in this top right quadrant of the activation. We often pimp, remember pimping, that was uh, my uh, old attendings used to say, oh, well, pimping works. Pimping works because it's activating, but it's activating negative. So look at all the emotions that you're eliciting. And yes, memory and emotion are very closely tied, but wouldn't you rather them have a positive experience and be able to have the memory tied to those positive emotions as opposed to the negative emotions? And the other, uh, some of the cognitive psychology that goes behind games is very strongly tied to the concept of flow. And Mihai Csikszentmihalyi uh, was a Hungarian psychologist um, who actually coined the term flow. And he saw it within um, elite athletes and he started noticing it across other different uh, areas, including musicians. And basically flow state is the state in which people are so involved in activity that nothing else seems to matter. The experience itself is so enjoyable that people will do it even at great cost for the sheer sake of doing it. So imagine being in those experiences where time just vanishes and you don't know where time went. Some people, it might be grant writing, more power to you. A lot of people, it's within games. And so obviously, can we create the flow state that experiences in games within medical education? That's the question we're here to ask. There's a concept within education called the zone of proximal development, probably my favorite, uh, one of my favorite cognitive psychology terms. And basically, the zone of proximal development is where essentially with a little bit of scaffolding, your students can progress in the most efficient manner through their learning. And we know that if their skill is above the area that you're teaching them, that they'll get very bored and they'll disengage. We also know if the challenge is too high, then they'll get confused or disenfranchised in negative emotions and they'll opt out. This is very important within game development because remember games are an opt-in experience. These are intrinsically motivated individuals who are trying to engage with these games. If you take them into an area where their skills are not being challenged or they're not being challenged enough, they will opt out. And so there's magic within how flow states are actually created within games. And there's actually formulas of how to create them. And in games, we don't call them zone of proximal development. We actually call them the regime of competence. And um, there's other concepts that do come into games, including deliberate practice, which is people maybe know as the colloquial 10,000 hour rule, as well as desirable difficulties. Again, trying to keep people at the top of their game to try and keep challenging them time and time again, because that's going to lead to the most maximally efficient learning. So what is a game? Um, so a lot of people ask me, you know, how do I know if this is a game or a simulation? We'll talk about that a little bit later. My answer is always, were you having fun? Um, so usually games are designed for you to have some kind of set of rules or set of decisions to make within the game. Those decisions then result in consequences, and then you're allowed to make more decisions to have more consequences and choose your own adventure and have your own autonomy through the experience.
Gamification. So gamification, we're going to touch on a little bit. Gamification is essentially taking something that is not necessarily a game and applying some game mechanics to it or game principles. A lot of people invite competition. So competition is one of the most common gamification applications. And you've seen this on Peloton. You've seen this on SoulCycle. You've seen this on all different things. And I think, Michael, this is this is from yours, right? Yeah, these are some gamifications that have been applied to me, whether it's posting in a conference, uh, a, a multiple choice quiz contest to learn infectious disease, and also the gamification system that's for our student evaluations at my university. So some people, especially hardcore game developers, think gamification is a snake oil. It's the concept that if you apply superficial game elements to games, that they'll actually change the motivational pattern and change people's behavior. What we know is that games is, again, it's a $257 billion uh, industry. There's a very deep psychology that goes into game development. Does gamification work? Yes, absolutely. There are are, are really good applications of game mechanics within life, but it by itself does not create a game, does not change motivations. Math Blaster is the example that comes to mind. So if anybody's old enough as me, we remember Math Blaster, we literally would just shoot numbers at other numbers to create other numbers. There, It wasn't necessarily fun. Um, and in games industry, you can go to the next one. In games industry, we call this chocolate covered broccoli because it's the concept that the chocolate makes it look very appetizing. You bite it and there's broccoli behind it. That being said, the gamific- the word gamification has a separate meaning within the games and serious games world, the sphere, because people assume that people are using proper techniques and proper game mechanics to actually apply to these different uh, facets to actually change motivation behavior. So we just hold people to a higher standard. So what is serious games? So serious games is essentially a game with an intent to have a purpose other than the game itself. So it may be to learn a specific skill. Um, in, and Teresa, Teresa is going to talk to you about Gridlocked. It's a definitely uh, the application of game mechanics to achieve a purpose or a goal and develop a set of skills within a certain field. And we'll talk more about that later. And so these skills that you can develop and you can develop games for is not just medicine. We're talking city planning. We're talking military uses a lot of game mechanics and a lot of serious games, politics, um, medicine. You know, we're we're seeing a lot more uh, interest within the gamification and serious game space to try and figure out ways that we can apply these really deep psychology and these very deep discipline onto other areas. and, And again, try to improve our way to experience and learn about these. So this is a really good for me um, when everybody asks me, what's the difference between simulation, serious games, video games? So um, this is a really good thing that we'll share out. I'm not going to go through it, um, but it's, a, it's sort of a way that I sort of organize it in my own head. And that's it for me. 